G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. Welcome, everyone. Today, I'm interviewing Christy Baird from Drip IV based in Gold Coast, Australia. Thanks for your time today, Christy. Thanks for having me. Let's start with how we know each other. So I reached out to you on LinkedIn and thought you'd be a great guest to come on. Thank you for reaching out. No, I appreciate it. Tell our audience a bit about your business, what it does and how it makes money. Of course. So Drip IV was founded in 2018. Um, We offer a wide range of vitamin IV services to the client's home, office, or hotel. Um, And we also have a a clinic partnership and a franchise model to the business. So we have grown all over Australia in four years, um, started in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and grew very, very quickly within probably about six to eight months of starting the business. Wow. Fantastic. And how, how did you come across the idea Uh, Look, I had my own health battle. So I come from a background of having cosmetic injecting clinics. I was a managing partner in Sydney um, and Canberra. And I had a glandular fever when I was 13, which then developed in my adult life into chronic fatigue syndrome. So if you know anything about chronic fatigue, it's pretty debilitating and it's hard to maintain any form of work, social functioning life. Um, So I was in LA at the time visiting friends and they introduced me to IV therapy over there. It's very, very common. It's like going out to get a cup of coffee. It's on every corner. And I was lucky to be there for four weeks. So I had a number of treatments done over there. Uh, Felt human for the first time in probably 10 years came home back to Sydney and could not find anyone that offered the service, looked high and low. And I just thought this needs to be in Australia. It needs to be a thing. So I, yeah, sold out of my previous company and um, put everything I had into Trip IV because I knew how beneficial this would be for the Australian public. Yep. Fantastic. So maybe go back to the start. Did you do uni, have a corporate job then and tell us a bit about the other business you had? Yeah, of course. So um, I come from having a business degree. I've always worked in the nursing medical field, cosmetic injecting, laser skin. Um, So I've kind of had my toes in that, you know, industry for a while. Um, My first business actually was when I was 17. So I've always been pretty business minded. Um, I'm always popping off with different ideas. So yeah, I was in the cosmetic injecting field and cosmetic skin field for about 12 years before I jumped into the side of things. Wow. Okay. Fantastic. And so you founded that other business? No. So I was the managing partner. It was almost uh, similar to a franchise model. So I bought into existing clinics um, and yeah, Bondi Beach, Edgecliff. So I had a few in Sydney. Yep. Okay. And when you started Drip IV in 2018, how old were you then? Uh, I was doing the maths, 29, 28, 28. 28, five years ago. Yeah, almost 34 now. Yep. And do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth of the business? Yeah. So uh, end of financial year last year, we saw exponential growth, which we put down to a number of factors. I think COVID was a big one for us. It really changed people's mindsets on keeping their immune system strong. So we saw a huge amount of business growth. So uh, end of financial year, we saw 330% growth in a year. Wow. That's phenomenal. Yeah, it was a crazy year. <laughs> yeah. And uh, how many team members did you start with full time and how many do you have now? Uh, we started with just myself and another nurse and I now have 35 um, full time. We have part time, we have contractors and we also have um, franchise staff as well, but 35 full time. Yeah. So if you added in the like the others, the part timers and the contractors, if they were equivalent to full time. Yeah. What's probably reckon? about 70 odd if we included everyone else. Holy shit. Right. That is fast growth in five years. <laughs> well done. Yeah. It's been a crazy five years. <laughs> and and what about the you already had some experience in the franchising side of things from the last business. So um it was this time around it was fairly easy for you to set up the franchising side of it. Look, I learned what not to do. I learned Mm -hmm. a lot of um, really good values in my previous business. 
um, and how I would structure things very differently. Um, I think having bricks and mortar, you know, your return on investment is a lot longer. Hence why I created a mobile business because you don't have the overheads that you do with, you know, your rent and fit out. Um, so your, you know, your profit margins are a lot higher. Um, I also really made a lot of time and structured the franchise model so that it was really beneficial for the franchisee and just not the franchisor, which I think is where a lot of people go wrong. Mm. Um, so, you know, at the time it felt like a business failure, my previous one, but I learned a lot of, you know, great tips on things to do the right way. So that's what I took into this business. Yeah. Cause I've had a few people on that have franchised their business. Um, uh, Tina Tower, who I mentioned before hit record, I'll send you her podcast. That was an amazing podcast. I didn't need to drink coffee for three days after talking to her. Oh, good. She, she had a negative kind of experience cause, uh, she had an after school tutoring kind of business for primary school kids and, and uh, three physical stores. And then she franchised it. I think she got to 12 or so had adrenal failure, she was just working too much and um, sold it off. But and then uh, Daphne Crowhurst, I've had her on when her and her husband split, she's in Adelaide. She's got, I think they had one paint shop there and she said, fuck it, I'm going to grow this thing after they split. And she got up to 30 franchisees, I think from memory, all the numbers could be the other way around. But I'll show you those two cars you might be interested in hearing. I'm always keen to understand more about the franchising side of a business because I've never, never really done anything in that corner. Yeah, it's very, um, very strict, the franchising code of conduct, um, and it's been updated last year. So there's a lot of rules to play by, but um, it benefits both sides, really. Yeah, I've heard that Australia is the highest franchise country in the world per capita, obviously. Yeah, wow. I didn't know that. Mm. When was the moment you felt like you succeeded? Um, I probably felt like I had imposter syndrome for a while. Um, I think when it really kind of hit home was when I won entrepreneur of the year. Um, that was a good moment. And then winning businesswoman of the year last year as well. I the, think the, the Telstra one. No, no. Um, Gold Coast. Gold Coast. Business. Yep. Great. Yeah. So I think having those wins makes you sit back and reflect on how far you've come. I think when you get so busy in your day-to-day -day work life, you forget to look back on where you were how many years ago. So those were some pretty exciting moments for me. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you. What does success look like to you? Success looks very different to me what it did a few years ago. I've really reevaluated what my success goals are the last six months. Success to me used to be, um, you know, money in the bank, assets, um, you know, growing as big as I possibly could. Success is now having freedom, having work-life balance, um, having great friendships, relationships. That's kind of my success now. So I've really revalued that the last six months. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast-growing business? I would recommend not outsourcing your marketing. I made that mistake. Um, there's a lot of outsourcing marketing companies, PR companies that are not fully invested in your company or your vision or your goal. I think finding that key team player um, as a marketing manager, invest in that. And it works out to be about the same anyway. Get that key player first, who's really, really competent, you know, in your digital marketing, SEO, Google AdWords, um, and grow your team from there. That would be the best advice I'd have. Yeah, very good advice. How did you fund the business? So you said you, you scraped together your savings. Yeah, I didn't initially have two investors to help me start and get off the ground when I first started. Um, and it was crunching a lot of numbers for the first six months while we we're expanding rapidly. And then it all kind of, you know, enveloped from there. And so do you still have those investors in the business or you bought them out? Uh, I bought one out. I have one silent investor, yeah. Yeah, great. Fantastic. Um, if you were to start up today with plenty of funding, would you go into your industry? I would, yes. I would do things probably very differently. Um, I think I would do it, uh, I would get a really solid team together first, um, knowing what I know now and having the right key team players and also with franchising, going more into owning commercial real estate as well, having them as landmark places for you to kind of launch from. So that, that, I think that's the McDonald's model, isn't it? Often they'll buy the building and then lease it to the franchisee. Yes, that's yeah. what I would do differently. Yeah, great. And out of interest, how many franchisees do you have now? 
So we were on a licensed model. We moved over to a franchise model about six months ago. So we've just rolled it out again. Um, and so we're up to four now. Yep. Right. We've got um, 11 previous licensees. Yep. Uh, and they're coming over? Yes. Yeah, I got it. So that'll be 15 by the time they've all transitioned. Yeah. And then we've got a lot, a lot in the works over the next few months. So we're opening a lot of new locations, which is super exciting. <laughs> it is. Yeah. You said before we hit record, you've just been out of Hobart last week and opened one down here. Yes, we have Lavada and Hobart. Um, amazing space. If you ever get to check it out, it's very beautiful. Um, so yeah, Hobart and then hopefully Launceston soon. We've got a few in up in North Queensland that will be happening um, in the next month, which we can release soon. <laughs> I'm assuming you're a big fan of Janine Ellis from Boost Juice. Have you studied her? I have, yeah. 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 Mark Boris. I've got yep. a few little mentors that I keep my eyes on. Yep, good. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? Um, there's many. There's daily occurrences. Um, I would say staff are by far the hardest um, thing in the business. It's finding the right team members, learning how to identify those team members um, and making sure that you're creating job roles that are of a necessity, you know, not just creating job roles to fill the space. Um, but yeah, I'd say identifying key staff members. Yep. What area in business do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Probably my own self-development. Um growing a, a big company what would started a small company and now we're you know a, a pretty large company i think i've had to work on my own growth so that i can be the best version of me for my team and for the business um which i'm you know always working on self development as much as i can and what have you enjoyed the least about managing fast growth probably zero work life balance um that goes out the window when you grow at a speed that we've grown at um yeah, I would definitely say zero work-life balance, but I've put a lot of structure into my year this year and I've really prioritised having boundaries about my work hours. I used to work till 2, 3 a.m. in the morning and, you know, really burnt myself out last year. So I've really focused on my health, my fitness, keeping those boundaries in place so that I do have a work-life balance. Yeah, yeah, it's it's hard. It's uh, really tempting when I first started late 99 to internet companies. I was working 100-hour weeks, which is just yeah. insane. And not healthy. <laughs> not healthy. No, I learned the hard way. Yep. What do you love most about growing a small business? I think celebrating the small wins with my team because we're all, you know, have the same goal and some same vision together. I think being able to celebrate with all of your your team members is super exciting. Um, and really reflecting back on how far you've come. Yep. What has been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? Um, mindset shift would probably be learning that you cannot be good at everything. You can't be all over all areas of the business. You can't be a marketing manager, HR, accounts, and a CEO. You really have to identify where your weaknesses are and employ those people that can complement your weaknesses. Yeah. Yep. Good advice. Mm -hmm. The number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain. I think getting your systems and processes in early, um, you know, there's a lot of great digital platforms now where you can get a lot of systems and contracts and, you know, digitally signing things. I think um, that's, you know, a really great place to start is creating a great platform online to work with. Sorry, which system do you use for that out of interest? Uh, we use a few. We use Jotform. Metronomics is really great for KPIs and goal setting, um, tracking with your team where you're at as a company. Jump over to growersmallbusiness.com and leave your details to get a short two-minute email I send on Fridays to help small business owners like you become better leaders. I include some reading or professional development resources I've discovered in the last week. Can you talk to how you've added people to the team, some wins, mistakes, and advice for those listening? Some wins that we've experienced would yep. definitely be um, 
that are the amount of locations. We've got 110 locations. So growing from one to 110 is pretty exciting. Um, definitely, I'm super proud of the team that we've created. We all work very well. We're predominantly female, 98% female um, team. We had International Women's Day last week. Mm. Um, so that was exciting. Um, I think the losses is I've had to identify that maybe sometimes I'm not a great judge of character when hiring staff and um, making sure you have the right management team that come in that complement your team and don't come in to, you know, disrupt and affect the way that you work. Yep. No, very important. So you've that you've beefed up your uh, learning and understanding of around recruitment in the last few years. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, definitely. What are some of the things you recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? I think sustaining a great culture is so important and it can probably be looked over a lot. You know, even small things where it's like a weekly drink together or lunch together, um, trying to make that time where you can all spend time not talking about work for, you know, whether it be half an hour, an hour, um, kind of bonding outside of work, um, making sure you are checking in with those team members, what's going on in their life, just having that relatability, I think. Yep, no, that is good advice. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. Uh, learn from my mistake. I didn't handle balance. I now do. <laughs> um, I make sure I prioritize my fitness. I think daily exercise for me um, really lowers my stress. I make sure that I'm doing something in the morning or an evening. I find that if I start my day by some form of exercise, my day runs so much smoother. So that's really what I prioritize now. Yeah. Um, I have a curse that because I love what I do, I find it hard not to work. Is is that more for you? It's not out of necessity per se. It's just you've got that drive and passion. Yeah. It's a a curse. curse. Yeah. I'm thinking of a million different business ideas when I'm supposed to be sleeping every night. <laughs> yep. My brain ticks off at about 10 p.m. and I try and force myself to go to sleep. Yep. Yeah. And how much professional development have you invested in yourself? Look, I try and do, I do a lot of podcasts. I do a podcast probably most mornings. Um, I've done a lot of seminars that are held over in the US on biohacking. I'm very big into biohacking. Dr. David Sinclair, I follow really closely. I kind of jump onto any talks that he's doing. Um, I do a lot of research and market development on my industry and what's new and upcoming things. Um, so constantly seeking out. No, I read a stat the other day that Australia yeah, that Australia is the highest podcast consumers in the world per capita again, obviously. Mm. 40, 40% of um, people aged 13 and over listen to at least one cast a week and there's something like 10% that do six or seven a week. So it's it's really starting to gain momentum now. It's a great, well, I find as well, it's a great way to learn. 100%. I think if you listen to the right ones, it really motivates you as well. Yeah, definitely. Have you had mentors or coaches along the way? Yeah, look, I was really lucky that when I first started in Sydney, I was a part of a business club and um, I met a lot of great people there. I did a lot of networking. I learned a lot from that um, club that it was called. And yeah, I think that was a really great starting point. I follow a lot of mentors. As I said, Mark Boris, I follow really closely. Um, Stephen Bartlett overseas. I, I listen to his podcast a lot. Um, most recently in the last six months, I've actually paid and hired someone to be, um, almost like a board of directors, um, and mentoring me for the exponential growth that we've had and also mentoring me in expanding overseas and other parts of the business. Yep. So have you bounced overseas yet or that's next? That's what you're looking at next. That's next. Yeah, that's next. And also developing our own range of consumable medical products. So um, that's what's launching in the next few months. Oh, great. Fantastic. I assume New Zealand's next stop? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> great. So you you don't have a board of directors or advisors at the moment? You've got that one advisor that kind of acts like a board? Yes, currently. Yep. Uh, now, you're one of the few that's been on that's exited a business. Do you have any advice for the audience thinking about exiting, what they should do or what you would do differently? I don't really think I had an option to exit differently with my previous business. Um I think, I mean, the the best advice is make sure you get into it 
the right way to begin with and making sure you have the right contracts in place. Um, I think exiting and making sure that you get the right people that can kind of continue on with your vision of why you started the business. Yep. All right, Chris, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing a small business? Again, finding the right team. It's so crucial. I can't stress that enough. Yep. A favorite business book, which has helped you the most? Atomic Habits is one that I love. James Clear? Yeah, so just your daily habits and how to um, create those habits daily that, you know, just become second nature. Yep. Yeah, it's a great book. Mm. Any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Diary of a CEO is probably my most listened to podcast, I'd say. Stephen Bartlett, he's from the UK. He interviews a lot of great entrepreneurs. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? I think having a great accounting system that can integrate with your um, your payroll is a key. Zero, a metronomics is great for scaling and putting KPIs in place for your team. Yep. Finally, my favorite question. What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? It will all be okay. <laughs> You'll get to that goal. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for your time today, Chrissy. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, congratulations, phenomenal growth over the last five years, starting on your own to up to around 70 full-time equivalents now, 110 locations and 333, sorry, 330% growth last financial year is amazing. So very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. That's it. Thanks for listening. Please leave a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. It means more small business owners will find our cast and help people with their business growth journey.